So thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues, Dr. Giovanni Traverso, a uh, physician at Brigham Women's Hospital and an associate professor at MIT, um, and Dr. James Byrne, a radiation oncologist at the Brigham and also MIT affiliate. Um, back in late February, early March, we started developing um, a respirator that could be reusable to address the shortage of PPE that we saw in uh, across the country and across the world. Um, to develop this respirator that could be reused uh, and sort of uh, address the, the needs of healthcare workers that we saw as well as a, a shortage of PPE. Um, and so along with uh, my colleagues on the call, um, you can see the, the faces of, of all the people that helped us along the way. And so our, uh, the overview of this uh, discussion will be uh, in initially the motivation, um, a bit of our design and in-house testing. Uh, and then James will take over and, and talk about our clinical trial and the results of those, um, as well as some very interesting uh, technology that we're able to incorporate into that, which is uh, three-dimensional face scanning um, and some simulation analysis work that we were able to do with those face scans. Um, and then our colleague, uh, Jackie Chu, uh, was, was very uh, instrumental in, in facilitating a uh, cost and waste analysis of, of our uh, masks alternative um, for clinical translation. So we have a nice uh, animation here that shows our mask sort of uh, in the uh, overlaid over a 3M 1860 model, which is uh, the basis for our original design. So the original motivation, as I said, was to create a, a reusable N95, um, and that also would be a surgical N95, which resists uh, liquid, uh, liquid penetration as well as flammability, and so those are some additional standards that they need to meet. Um, it needs to be sterilizable, which means it needs to, uh, you know, have some extra qualities of the material choices. And it's going to be a filtering face piece respirator. So that's the technical term for this type of face mask. Um, in an effort to address the critical needs of, of healthcare workers and changes that we saw in standards of care back in March. So if we look at this from a design uh, sort of matrix, we have user needs on the left or these functional requirements. Um, not only does it need to be reusable, but it needs to be comfortable, scalable, so we can make high quantities. and also has to be safe. It has to meet the uh, NIOSH uh, fil filtration limits and also some FDA standards. Um, so if we look across some of these boxes, we see you know, resistance to um, heat, steam, chlorine, um, constant mechanical properties of these materials. Uh, for, for comfort, we're looking at a flexible material that exhibits low pressure on the face. Um, we have to meet qualitative and quantitative uh, fit testing. We need to make sure that they have no skin reactions. Uh, for scalability, we need to choose a proper manufacturing technique. Uh, in this case, we went with injection molding. Um, and to be safe, we need to have well, one skin safe materials. Um, on top of just the face piece, we need a filtration that, that meets uh, at least 95% filtration standards. And so the design criteria essentially gets split into these two major categories, one for our uh, silicone rubber face piece. And the second set of uh, criteria uh, are related to the filter material itself. So these were developed in parallel. Um, so I kind of went over these, these criteria already. And then I can talk a little bit about our prototyping process. So originally uh, we have this design and prototyping phase. We then go to literature review, in-house testing, and that builds our knowledge base. So as James and I started this back in, back in March, you know, we learned a lot about filtration materials. What are the, the needs required of those? Um, as well as masks and how they fit on someone's face. And then that iterate, uh, iterate, iteration process goes on to inform our next design. So on the right side of the screen, you can see the version one, version two uh, that we've gone through. 
uh, original design was, was very simple. We reached out to filter experts that told us about uh, requirements of filter area, um, how turbulent flow can affect filtration. Um, In-house prototypes like the one you see on the, the mannequin head on the left informed, you know, is this easy to use? Uh, other components such as straps that go on the mask and a nose piece, how do those actually fit? Um, how are they durable? And so for, for a larger quantity of testing, we took those in-house prototypes of our version one that was injection molded and we took it to Brigham and Women's Hospital um, to, do, uh, to do qualitative fit testing there. So to speak a little bit about this prototyping process, there are three major factors that you have to consider when you're doing this and they are speed, cost, and volume. Uh, obviously we can produce some prototypes in-house that are very fast, but a volume of only one or two and relatively high in cost. And th those are not scalable. Um, those, for example, could be 3D printed, right? And uh, I'll draw your attention to the graph on the left here, injection molding versus a 3D printing cost curve. That injection molding initially is very expensive, but when you get out to units of 10,000 or more, uh, which is the objective here, that your cost becomes lower than if you were just to 3D print something. Um, these these uh, lines are arbitrary. Uh, the unit cost can shift up or down depending on the actual product that you're using. Um, and so we would expect the number of units and that offset to actually be much earlier in our product. You can see a little schematic of how injection molding works, where you are injecting a, a viscous material into a mold cavity. It then, then cures to a solidified state, and then you can pop out the, the product. For this process, you're gonna get very repeatable dimensions um, and very close to the CAD model that you, you designed, but there are some limitations in the geometry that you can output. Um, so that was part of our, our uh, design process. We had those prototypes made at Proto Labs, which is in Maple Plain, uh, Minnesota. And the material that we chose is a liquid silicone rubber, which meets the material properties uh, list on the top right, which is skin safe, flexible, heat and chemical resistant, and injection moldable. Uh, and the actual material that we chose is the same used, at, used in uh, anesthesia masks, which is a Dow polymer. So out of the flexible polymers of the polymer candidates that you see, liquid silicone rubber met uh, all of the criteria. Um, these are some of the CAD models from the, the second version, which uh, our uh, paper just came out in ACS uh, recently. But you know, just so you can have a sense of the, the features that are included in the mask, um, draw, your, draw your attention to detail C, which is a, a mushroom-shaped projection on the nose, which holds down the nose piece. Uh, detail E shows you uh, the slits where the straps can be attached. And detail A shows you little pockets, essentially where the filters can be inserted and removed uh, by healthcare workers at the beginning and end of their shifts. Um, the the cross-section can show you that the model has even thickness all around, which is amenable to the injection molding process. And the figure on the top right shows you the uh, process to operate the mask, which is very simple insertion of uh, cartridge or pancake filters from the outside into these uh, cavities. For sterilization and mechanical testing, we, we use autoclave cycles up to 100 cycles, um, exposure to high heat up to 200 degrees Celsius for uh, 100 hours, um, long-term exposure to isopropyl alcohol and as well as bleach. So we had these dog bone shapes that are standard for mechanical testing, uh, for materials testing, stamped out of the actual injection molded masks and it, um, uh, gone through each of these sterilization processes and then uh, tensile tested to show you the mechanical properties after being sterilized. And so you can see the displacement actually at the beginning of the curve, less than 100 uh, millimeters, the, the slopes are very similar, uh, usually in the zero to, to 20 millimeter range is the actual stress, stress that these uh, masks will go under. So we're looking at the slope there. And so you can see there's very little deviation in the curves between all of these uh, sterilization techniques to show you that the performance will be the same. And then James can take over, uh, talk about the, the clinical trial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Adam. And so just in terms of the, the next slide, um, we ended up performing these qualitative fit tests um, trials over both at, at Brigham Women's as well as as Mass General. 
Um, and as a part of these trials, and, and we performed two in total, um, the, each of these trials really were uh, required inclusion exclusion criteria where we were just looking at healthcare workers that were older than 18 years old. Um, they needed to have passed uh, the qualitative fit test for an N95 respirator um, within a year. And then also um, just as a part of every qualitative fit test have no facial hair, given that that would impact the ability to pass the qualitative fit test. Um, in terms of some of the baseline um, assessments, we ended up looking at some of the demographics, uh, the occupations of the healthcare workers that were involved within the trial, um, and then ended up performing the, the OSHA approved fit test. And what this actually involves um, is ensuring that the subject itself is sensitive to whatever you're using to test. So we were using a sweet, sweet tasting material called saccharin. Um, and then we would have the, the user, the healthcare worker actually don the respirator and put that on. And then through a couple of different maneuvers, you're, you're able to test um, whether or not the mask itself is sealing enough so that the person cannot taste that sweet tasting material. Um, and if they are, have deemed to have not tasted that material, then they are deemed to been deemed to pass that fit test. Um, and they're uh, able to use that respirator going forward within the hospital setting. Um, afterwards, we ended up performing an exit interview and, and obtaining user feedback. Next slide. Um, and what we got in terms of the, the subjects, we ended up enrolling four, 47 subjects. Uh, seven of them um, were actually unable to taste that sweet tasting solution. Um, and that's common out in the community. Um, there's a range of, of abilities to taste that that material. Um, and so we ended up testing on 40 individuals and found that all 40 individuals um, were able to successfully uh, pass the fit test itself. Um, and so this gave us a lot of confidence in terms of moving forward. Um, we also got some user experience data regarding the respirator, our, our, our system, um, in terms of fit, breathability, and filter exchange. And uh, in terms of uh, the skills, that we ended up getting excellent to good ratings for every single aspect uh, of the mask. And, and uh, we ended up having healthcare workers that wanted to continue on using it within the, the hospital uh, during their shift, um, given how comfortable it fit and as well as the safety that they uh, perceived that it was providing. Um, and so in terms of uh, next slide, um, as a part of this, we also uh, performed uh, a fit analysis of the respirator. We ended up getting facial scans of all of the healthcare workers that underwent the clinical trial. Um, and then using finite element modeling actually modeled um, the fit of the respirator and the amount of uh, force required to actually keep the respirator on their face and found that it was within a comfortable range for each of the wearers. On top of this, and this is actually one of the aspects that we're hoping may shift the paradigm generally for all types of respirators. Um, and this is work done with Anatha Chandrakasan, one of the dean, the dean of engineering over at MIT in his lab, um, where they developed a sensor that could be inserted within the respirator and give the user feedback on a number of different characteristics, including respiratory rate, temperature, as well as pressure. And that, that's hugely important in terms of fit. So what we're able to do is actually determine when the mass was leaky based upon the pressure difference in terms of exhalation versus inhalation. Um, also look at a well-fitting mask and, and determine those pressures within the mask as a result of it being well-fitting. And then in terms of, of when the mask or the, the the mask media itself is exhausted and completely full of, of particles, um, you would imagine that that pressure would increase. And so we simulated that by covering one of the filters and we saw that pressure difference actually increase. And so this was a, a great mechanism to evaluating really user uh, or biometric feedback for the user so that they would have an idea of how well their mask functions. Um, on top of that, um, we also wanted to look at uh, other alternative ways to assess the mask fit. And one way to do that, we looked at a thermochromic paint and actually uh, it's paint that changes colors upon contact or uh, an increase in temperature. So upon contact with the skin, you can determine um, how well the mask fit by placing a number of the, the thermochromic paint or pieces um, along the inside of the mask, which will give you that, that feedback on fit.
Um, and so in terms of the original mask, you can see that the, the paint itself is black. Um, upon wearing the mask for two minutes, you can see that uh, all of these points of contact, which are important and critical to the fit of the mask, um, will turn pink. And so if you have an inappropriately fitting mask, um, you would still have uh, the black color rather than the pink color. Um, the next next thing that we did was actually a cost effective analysis um, of the our, our respirator compared to the the standard that's out there. And so in looking through this um, prior to COVID, uh, we would on a routine basis actually use a single respirator per patient encounter. So we don the respirator, go into the patient's room, and then afterwards just discard it all together. That was standard throughout all hospitals across the nation. Um, because of COVID and because of the, the known deficits of um, respirators, um, we ended up pushing that paradigm to um, one respirator per day. Um, and you can see in terms of the cost of that, there's a reduction in cost by reusing that mask during that single day period. Um, when we compare that to our reusable respirator system with disposable filters where you would dispose them of them really at the end of the day or after the end of the shift, you can see a reduction in terms of cost um, all altogether, even more than more than half. Um, now, at least the standard within the Boston hospitals are to use this hydrogen peroxide vapor de decontamination system, um, the Patel method, and that further reduces cost in that they're able to reuse the mask up to a standard um, almost 20, 20 times. I know that various hospitals have different standards, and, and at Brigham Women's, that that standard itself is a lot lower, um, and so. Uh, in, in terms of, of comparing our system to the Patel system, we can even further enhance that cost effectiveness of doing one surgical mask, uh, of doing our respirator with decontaminated filters that undergo serialization through the hydrogen peroxide vapor decontamination system. Um, and then we also compare that to one surgical mask, which is also a significant reduction in terms of protection that it would afford um, in the setting of COVID. And so um, we're, we're almost comparable to that in terms of a cost, effect, cost effective strategy to that of a sur surgical mask per day. In terms of sustainable use strategies, we're also finding that our system really blows everything out of the water in terms of um, the amount of waste that's generated from the mass and the disposable filters. And so um, by doing a combination of the Patel method for decontamination, as well as our reusable respirator, we're able to significantly reduce the amount of waste that's generated. Um, and you can see in terms of, of 1.4 million kilograms um, per, per year compared to somewhere on the order of 82 a million kilograms per year per patient encounter. And so in terms of the project timeline, um, the, um, this has been a rapid evolution of the respirator itself where <clears throat> the pandemic was declared on March 11th. We had version one of the respirator March 25th. And then moving through um, two different clinical trials, two different versions of the respirator, um, we ended up uh, filing our provisional patent on August 13th and then incorporating TIL Bio on September 22nd.